<laughs> so um, I guess one of the things I wondered is one, this, this yes brain. The one obvious question is, what do you mean by the yes brain? And I wondered, I've seen you talk about an exercise that you do that's no, no, no. Yeah. Is that an exercise that you think we should do? I do. Okay, let's yeah. do it. Go ahead. Take, to explain what it is and, and how it fits with well, this concept Well, after you're yes brain. saying before, my explanations go on and on and on. They're hard to understand. It's probably Did I say that? I thought so. <laughs> Didn't she say that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would, uh, and what I meant is, mind sight's a complex concept. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I think an exercise is Okay, a let's do, do it. So, um, for this exercise, uh, all, all you need to do is just turn your phones off, make sure you're just sitting comfortably in your chair, and I'm just going to say a word, and I'll repeat it several times, and then I'll pause, and I'll say another word, repeat it several times. We'll do a few more things. Um, and then we'll talk about what that was like for you. So all you need to do is um, just be aware of whatever arises in your experience. So you don't need to do anything. Okay, you ready? No. 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 Yes. 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 Yes, 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 yes. Now take a nice deep breath. And try putting one hand on your chest and the other hand on your abdomen and put some gentle pressure. And just sense what that feels like. Nice deep breaths. And then switch it out so whatever hand is on your chest goes to your abdomen, the one on your abdomen goes to your chest. Just put some gentle pressure. Take some nice deep breaths. And now put it in whichever configuration was the most comforting for you, left on top or right on top. Put some gentle pressure. Nice deep breaths. And now take one big intentional breath, and we'll let this exercise come to a close. And if your eyes are closed, you can let your eyes come open. And let's just do a quick little survey, if we could. Um, how many of you felt that putting a hand on your chest and one of your abdomen, that was comforting? Raise your hand really, really high. OK, so that's the majority of us. And how many felt that it was equal left and right? It didn't matter which was on top. Raise your hand, OK. And how many felt left on top was the most comforting? OK, and right on top? OK, so someone could get a PhD studying this. No one knows why, but it's always that way. Most people find it comforting. It's very few find it equal. It's about 20% or so find it left on top, 80% or so right on top or oh favored. My goodness. No one knows why you have a built-in control group. I've done a study on one person, me, so I can tell you about that <laughs> later. Um, but someone can get a doctoral degree on that. It's really, really interesting. But from the grounding point of view that Linda uh, walked us through, it's a very grounding thing to find out what your space is, what, what way is comforting for you, to know how to ground yourself that way. But also, it's a beautiful way of building what's called interoception, perception of the interior. Uh, some of my colleagues at UCLA have shown, and other people too, that the more you're able to perceive the interior signals of the body, the more insight you have, the more empathy you have, and the more capacity you have for self-regulation. So, just comparing left and right for most people, you go, oh, that feels good, oh, that doesn't feel good. You know, you can see, feel the difference, and that's just a, a highlight of interoception. Now let's go to the yes and no part. 
How many of you felt a difference inside of you when I said no versus yes? Raise your hand. OK, so let's do this little exercise. I'll just pass my arm across and just shout out a word that reflects what you felt like with, let's start with no. And, and we'll, Maria and I will repeat them um, as we go, just so we can get some words out. What did no feel like? OK, let's do it one at a time. Well, you don't know if one. I'll just put my hand. You go ahead. Scared. Fear, surprise, physical, your dog. OK, two dogs. Yes, what's that, guilt, shame, defiant, frozen, restricted, heavy, small, jarring, tingly, closed. Restricted, what was that? Stressful, angry, startled, harsh, too hard. Sales? Oh, sales, I see. Motivates you. Very good. Sales. What's that? Sad. What's that? Shocking. A dog again? Was that? Bad? Powerless and shut down. Petulant. Petulant and tense. OK, so just remember these words. So when we talk about a no brain state, this is simply, if you say no harshly, you know, what is evoked from that? So we'll talk about the physiology of that in a moment. And now let's do the same thing with yes. So what did yes feel like? A warm bath. A warm bath. <laughs> What's that? Calming. Possibilities. Possibilities. Positive, the way it should be, soft, light. And in the back, you can say, too, bubbly, with a bubble bath. OK? Yes? Hopeful, warmly open, comforting, kind, made you smile. Safe. Safe, connected. Deep, expanded, over accommodating, accepted, accepted, accepted. freedom, freedom. connected, connected. Open. open. What was that there? Caring. Caring, confused, because it came right after no. Motivating, Motivating. Soothing. soothing, relief, opposite, opposite. Encouraging. encouraging, patient, patient. A, giraffe. a giraffe walking through the water. Oh, OK. Supportive. Supportive. Beauty. What's that? Beauty. Understood. Understood. OK, so let's remember that. That uh, is a beautiful set of, a uh, set of words that describes what we mean by a yes brain state. I mean, it's, I don't want to say it's a no brainer, don't make me but stand it's a. Up. No, you, but you don't have high heels on I your know, boots. but I got a little bit of a cramp because I had you know, high You're remembering. Yesterday. It's an implicit memory of the <laughs> I trauma. Have an implicit memory. <laughs> so tell us about what you heard with those words. Yeah, so first of all, the first thing to say is that for educators or parents or any of us on the planet, really, we, we need to know that our physiology has uh, an intimate relationship with the feelings we have. Um, and so we're gonna, we'll talk about the brain, but the brain is always in a whole body. So bless you. We can talk, let's have a bless you for everyone's going to sneeze. You ready? Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. So we'll talk about the embodied brain. And what happens in the embodied brain is you have two states, the no brain state and the yes brain state. The no brain state is called a reactive state. And it's, it's activated when you are threatened. And from a long line of evolutionary history, we have four different Fs that are involved in it. Fighting back, and you heard these in all the no statements. Fleeing, meaning running away. Freezing, meaning tighten up your muscles and uh, paralyzing yourself temporarily. Or if it's a complete sense of hopelessness, fainting, or what's sometimes called feigning death. And there's all sorts of reasons each of these four are very useful um, from our evolutionary history. But the important issue here is that many students in classrooms have a repeated no brain state that once you're 12 months of age, you start hearing no 
in hugely increasing amounts of ways from your parents and then from teachers. And it can be something as... Um, bless you. No, the bless you's already happened. So oh, now. you do it once for everybody? Once for everyone. Okay, sorry. Because otherwise, I found as a teacher, I'd just be blessing all yeah, the time. Okay. That's a different, God, that's you a didn't different career. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say no to me? <laughs> it's a great idea to bless everyone, Maria. <laughs> Thank you. No, you would no, say... No, no that's oh, okay, great. That's okay, a good okay, example. That's a good example. That's a Let's good do example. that. Yeah, okay. Okay, so Maria. I, I, I say bless you, you yeah. say... So, Maria... You either say no, don't do that. Uh, yeah, that could, I, which is what yeah. I did. So yeah, that you was did that, and that was good. very unkind. Thanks for it. Good. So let's make a repair. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's beautiful. So I could say, Maria, that's a great example of really feeling your intention to bless someone who sneezed. I was hoping the intention of all of us blessing that first person was that it would keep us from blessing everyone all day long. So I'm totally with you on the intention mm -hmm. about blessing that person. Mm -hmm. But for now on, if someone sneeze, sneezes, let's let the first two now uh, <laughs> <laughs> blessings count for the whole day. How that, that sounds like a very good idea, Dan. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't that child, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maria. You're welcome, Dan. Because so, I was thinking about this idea of a yes brain and a no brain, and you were talking about in a classroom. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to get a picture now of what that might look like. And you know what I started to think about was all of the uh, reactions to people in this room when they woke up this morning and saw the snow. Mm. Now, everybody made it here. But would there have been different yes brain and no brain reactions to getting here? Exactly, exactly. So the no brain is when you're in a state of threat. And what's really fascinating about that is it isn't just an actual threat. Um, our very complex minds built on complex brains um, and cultural meaning too, we create in part a feeling of threat. And that's compared to the other state, the yes brain state, which is a receptive state. And you heard these beautiful descriptions of what that feels like, open, loving, kind, sense of possibility. And there's lots of fascinating science behind that. But just let's call that a receptive state. So ideally, you want to go through life interacting with another person. Um, like in this interaction we just had, we could do a meta reflection on what just happened on the reflection. Like nobody's business. Yeah, that's that. right. But, but the idea is, you know, um, if someone says, oh, you gave me a no-brain response, you go, no, I didn't. You know, that would be mm -hmm. an example of like continuing mm -hmm. the problem. Mm -hmm. you I know. see what you're saying. So you can drop into a receptive state. Whenever you're having a communication with anyone, coming from a yes-brain state makes it much more likely that that communication will be rewarding, productive, and connecting. It's really where conversations come from. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's unfortunately what we're seeing the opposite of that in politics in the United States these days. Um, a lot of no brain comments are being made, and it's very. It... We laugh up here. <laughs> but so, so we need to start with all the children of the world because one day they might become whatever route they do that, become a president or something like that. <laughs> so, so we have to realize that having people first feel the difference between no and yes. With all my patients, I do this exercise with them. That's where the exercise comes from, by the way. Is I would do, I'm a therapist, so I would do it with my patients. And I found that children who are having regulation problems, self-regulation, I don't like that term. That's the formal term that's used, self-regulation problems. or the, some would say, oh, this little four-year-old has bipolar disorder or something like that. And I would be asked to be a, a consultant on the case, and I would do this no and yes brain experience. And kids with self, quote, self-regulation problems, they can't hear no without going berserk, even if we're just in a room saying no like I just said it. So it's not like they really want to go to a friend's house or have ice cream before dinner or something. Or even in this case, think about it. I'm not your father telling you you can't go to the problem with your, your friend or something. I'm just a guy up here on stage with Maria saying no harshly, right? And it evokes all this stuff. So, so how you deal with no, that's a whole other thing about mm -hmm. grounding yourself or becoming ungrounded. But once you get in this threat state, our complicated minds can actually 
interpret things like snow as a threat or a thrill, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And your mind can actually make that distinction. So when a child, here's, here's the secret sauce of the whole thing, where attention goes, neural firing flows and neural connection grows. Where attention goes means attention is that process which streams energy and information flow. And different people have different opinions about this, but from the, from the work I do is we see energy and information flow as the system of mind. So we don't locate it in the head because energy and information flow is not limited by the skull and we don't even limit it to the body because energy and information flow is happening now between Maria and I or me, whatever it's gonna be, between, between the two of us and all <laughs> of you, right? So there's energy and information flowing and the mind is as much inter as it is inner. So this isn't to diminish the importance of brain science, but that's one part of a much larger mind science, which includes anthropology and studying culture and indigenous peoples and, and practices and the way we are embedded in a culture or the way we extend cognition into all of our own embodied brains, if you will, and also smartphones and computers and stuff like that. So it's a different way of thinking about it, but for an educator, we need to understand that the no brain state is a relational process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's coming because attention was streamed in this harsh way. Right, oh, as is the S brain state. As is the S brain right. state. So that where attention goes, now we're gonna go into the brain and the head, neural firing flows. And the reason I said the brain and the head is because you have a brain around your heart and you have a brain around your intestines. So for the Dalai Lama Center, the idea of you know, heart-mind, to me, is kind of interesting because the heart is an organ of the body, which is cool, and awakening the heart or educating the heart or opening the heart is an awesome thing to do. I think it's absolutely essential and profound. But I would compare the heart to that brain because the mind includes them both. And the mind includes our relational connections, not just right here and now in this room, but across the generations. So when you see in modern contemporary times, we exclude our, the ancient uh, ancestors we have and the future generations, you're really violating what the mind is really all about. And so in contemporary culture, we've become incredibly solo self-oriented and to the detriment of an individual's sense of meaning and connection mm -hmm. and the detriment of the planet. Mm -hmm. Because then what you do is you treat the planet like a trash can, because who cares? All that matters is Danny in this body. So I get about 100 years, I better get as much stuff as possible for this body and mm -hmm. boots with heels or on heels or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so all, all, you know, the thing so is the, you, yeah. <laughs> so you see the world, you can see Dan's mind is, um, sees the world very, very, in a very large way. And I, I think it's, uh, it's the, uh, to me it's, so fascinating, it's taken me years actually to really understand this idea of the mind being interaction as well as the mind being in the brain, the mind. So it's interpersonal neurobiology yeah. is really the term that you phrased, interpersonal neurobiology. Um, for, for those of us who are um, still, still embracing those ideas and trying to understand those ideas, in a practical sense, we're interfacing with children every day. Yeah. And um, I think that probably what you're, you're saying in your book is that a yes brain is more helpful than a no brain in life. Or is that right? Yeah, I thought. So um, what does a yes brain um, look like in yeah. a child? So a yes brain, you felt it, right? Everyone felt it. So this is why it's really great that you invited us to do the exercise. Um, you know, in, in terms of the, the physiology of it, uh, you know, in, in this interpersonal neurobiology world, which is basically a field where we take all the different disciplines of science and combine them into one. So we take math and physics and chemistry and biology, which includes neuroscience and genetics and medicine and psychology and linguistics and sociology and anthropology. And we said, what if you made one field? So that's what we do. And now we have 65 textbooks that I've overseen the publication of. And two of those textbooks are about this one, this one question you're asking. So if you want to say, let me see the physiology of the S-brain, go to Steve Porges's um, Handbook of the Polyvagal Theory and the Polyvagal Theory. And I'll just summarize Steve's beautiful books and work, which basically goes like this. In the head brain, we've evolved to have this 
system that basically asks a fundamental question that Steve calls neuroception, meaning the brain's perceiving things. It's, he likes that term, but anyway. But it's a perception of, is it dangerous or is it not dangerous? Am I threatened or am I not threatened? So that's the first thing, that your head brain is doing a very sophisticated calculation, if you will. Is the setting of what's happening now a threat to my survival or my thriving or not? So that's question number one. Question number two is, if I assess that it's not threatening, then I turn on what Steve has beautifully named as the social engagement system. And again, you can read all of Steve's work in these books that, that, that he has in our series, but here's what that happens when you turn on the social engagement system. Your muscles relax. Literally, your perceptual filter is broadened so you can hear more and see more. Mm -hmm. Your, your conviction that what you think is right and has to be right, like if you're a politician making a statement or something, it relaxes and says, other points of view are valid too. It drops into a thing of, I am a part of a larger whole. So when we think about what Linda invited us to do this morning with grounding. Grounding is this beautiful example, and all of Linda's work is so fantastic, about creating a yes brain state that you know, in Rick's beautiful terms, you know, is the unshakable core, right? So when Maria invites us to watch this exquisite film, and this is the work of Dacher Keltner and, and others on awe, uh, and Dacher and I, have, we, we've had some fun uh, conversations about this, awe creates this profoundly integrative state, integrative being where you're, you're differentiating, linking, it allows you to drop out of a sense of a separate self. Mm. Awe, in Dacker's terms, Dacker Keltner at UC Berkeley, he defines it as when you're presented with something that is initially really hard to comprehend intellectually, and in your kind of confusion, like, oh, wow, how, this is so big, you get to feeling uh, first a little bit overwhelmed, mm -hmm. but then you start feeling a part of this larger whole. So that's, that's how he defines awe. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously paraphrasing it. In that state of awe, when you look at the brain and the head's functioning, it becomes profoundly integrated. The brain drops out of a separate sense of self, drops out of reactivity, and opens up to this yes brain state. So if you now we go back to Steve Porges' work, I'm trying to tie everybody's work together, but you go to Steve's work, and what Porges has shown is that this is a state of, he calls it the social engagement system is turned on. So a kid in school, who's being gra given grounded exercises or invited to be part, part of all, says, I'm little Billy and I'm at school, but I drop out of that separate self and I realize I'm here to learn. So if I try on a test and I don't do as well, this would now go to Carol Dweck's work on mindset. I go from the fixed mindset of, oh, I'm Billy and I've got to do this because this is who I am, to, no, I'm Billy and I try. And if how I try didn't make it so good this time, I'm going to try harder, mm -hmm. and I'll learn more. So it's the difference between a fixed mindset mm -hmm. and a growth mindset. So Carol Dweck, we were so excited when she, she endorsed our book because the book says, how do you actually create mm -hmm. such a positive state of courage and creativity? And what it means is, now coming back to our little Didi, where attention goes, neural firing flows. So if you are being given the experience in school of grounding, of building this sense of, a yes brain state, where neural firing flows is that state. When you've repeatedly created a state, because of something called neuroplasticity, this is the third part of the trio, where attention goes, energizes the brain and our relationships. Neural firing flows, now we're going up in the head, and neural connection grows. So a child who's in a classroom for, let's say, a semester or a whole year is getting grounding with a yes brain state and having a teacher respond with a yes brain a way of responding, or you're at home with this thing, you're going to have a trait of resilience because you've created this thing that Steve talks about, a social engagement system, which basically says, I'm ready to engage with the world. You know, if I get a C minus on a test, that just tells me I should try harder next time instead of a kid who collapses because they don't have the resilience. So we were talking about this earlier, 
right? The idea that, you know, it's okay to come up across something where you call it a failure or hard because you are not the product of what you do. You are the process of the journey of connecting and learning. And that's basically what a yes brain is. And in a, in a, we would all like that for our children and for ourselves. So we're going to talk about exactly how we can do that. And I just wanted to say that this is a time, if you have questions, just um, write your questions down on a piece of paper like we did yesterday. But but I, I didn't make it work quite right. Today it'll work right. Write your questions down if you have a piece on a piece of paper and just send them to the end of the aisle and then volunteers are back there, right? Let's just raise your hands. Great, and you're just gonna walk up and down. And Corrine, just bring me the questions as they come. Just don't worry, wait till the end. Just as they, if they uh, inspire you, just bring it up and we'll, we'll pick it up. If I have questions, should I write them down? <laughs> yes, if you have questions, you should write. But you need a clean piece of paper for okay. that. Okay, it's right here, you can share the paper. I won't write my questions down, I'll just say them, okay? Okay. Let's just agree to that. So that, first of all, I wonder about this um, idea of a yes brain. Uh, I think um, sometimes that it's about temperament, because I've seen some children are, are almost born with, a, with an openness and, an, and not a fear, and other children are born, seem to have that more scanning the horizon for risk and, and caution. So how much of that yes brain has to do with just plain temperament? Yeah, so temperament is a very important thing to discuss. And uh, a way to think about temperament in terms of development is, you know, the two big domains that influence us are genetics, including what's called epigenetic uh, regulation, which is genetics would be the sequence of DNA that you just, you inherit, but you also inherit how your parents and your grandparents responded to trauma uh, or even positive things by the non-DNA molecules that sit on top of the DNA get passed through the sperm and egg. So you actually... So we inherit our parents' experience through our DNA. That's the DNA doesn't change. Through the change, epigenetic control of the of DNA expression. It's sort of a dimmer switch on the DNA. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's just, if ever you're, especially around scientists, you want to say it super carefully, you can inherit epigenetic adaptations. Everybody write that down. Don't want to get it wrong. Because <laughs> right. it's, it's, it's a long historical debate. Yes, Does understand. experience change yeah. DNA? And yeah. as far as we can tell, yeah. it may change next year, but as far as we can tell, it does not change DNA sequence. Yeah. It changes the non-DNA molecules like histones yeah. and methyl groups yeah. that get passed through the sperm and egg yeah. that regulate how genes get expressed, which means how they influence brain development or even yeah. structure. And that, that's new and it's fascinating. Yeah. And it still results in the same thing, so which the, is the child comes out and they have, have a certain amount of A genetic of and epigenetic are. influence, we'll just call it genetic. Yeah. And then the other thing is experience. Mm -hmm. So the most we can try to do as parents or teachers is provide, even with a child with, let's say they're leaning towards um, an ease at which they activate a no brain yes. reactive state of um, fight, flight, freeze, and faint. Right? And there's a whole complex system about that, but let's just say that for what it is. You are basically shutting down learning, and you are in a, in a survival mode. That's basically what the, the reactive state is. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's in a, in a relationship with a friend, or a romantic relationship, or in a family, or in a school, you know, we, we have a, um, uh, actually, you, you might be interested in this, we have a whole program to study um, systems functioning in schools. Uh, so I'm working with Peter Sange and Otto Scharmer and Richie Davidson. And so we have this whole program where in, it, we'll have a big meeting in, in October looking at what we call generative social fields. And we've picked out nine prototypes of teachers who create what I would say, from my point of view, is a yes brain state in a classroom. And, we're gonna, and we have uh, you know, filmmakers going, hopefully as good as that 12th grader you had talked about the other mm -hmm. day. Keaton. You know, Keaton is here. You know, and, and so we're trying to study that because what those teachers do is magical. They create a, a generative social field would be what you do as a teacher to, this is now, we don't, we don't have the answer to what it does, this is now my interpretation. So I don't want to speak for my group because we haven't figured it out, that's why we're studying it. Here's my interpretation, having talked to these teachers. They have a way of sensing the individual experience of their students and honoring that and that's the first stage of creating a yes brain state, so that a child in that classroom says, I feel seen by my teacher, even though there's 30 kids in the classroom. 
Because when they raise their hand and say something, instead of the teacher just you know, saying, oh, whatever, they say, oh, that was so interesting. I see you were really noticing that giraffe walking through the water and wondering whether that giraffe was going to fall into the deep parts. Weren't you wondering that too? You know, that's really a, a very perceptive of you. Anyone have to have a comment? Just it takes 15 seconds. But the child's inner subjective experience was seen. They felt safe. And if they were distressed, they could feel soothed. The three big components of secure attachment, seen, safe, and soothed. So they felt secure. So that's an, what you can call an integrated classroom. That's what I think a general. And you're social talking group. about classroom, but if you're a parent or a grandparent, you're you're talking same about thing. the same thing. Yeah. So the first thing is to, um, uh, I mean, we can all remember a time in our life when we f feel seen, right? I mean, it's it's the activity that Linda w walked us through yesterday morning. I see you, right? Exactly. So children uh, feel seen, and from what you're describing, it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It's just saying. I, I see that you liked the giraffe. I see that you like to color with red. I see, yeah. and that, that's the first step. Even, it's the first step, and just to, to build on the science of this, you know, I went to medical school, and I was amazed how my professors did not see their patients. Mm -hmm. If they told them they were dying, they just walked out of the room. Mm -hmm. I dropped out of school, but came back. Years later, someone would do a study to show that if you are going for a common cold, and your physician, this is a controlled experiment, your physician would take about 30 seconds and just say, oh, Maria, you know, I know you've got a big project due in May, you're a student, you're, you know, this must be so hard for you to have a cold when you're studying for exams. Okay, I want you to drink lots of fluids and rest and all that kind of stuff. Versus another person who just gets to drink lots of fluids and rest, same instructions, but the person didn't identify your inner feeling mm -hmm. of frustration because you're a student or whatever, right? A fear or whatever, yeah. Fear, whatever yeah, yeah. it is about it. Yeah. So really saying, rather than you just being a body with actions that are happening to it, that's the physical side of the world, the mind side of it is that physician sees the mind of you. You will get over your cold a day sooner, and if we, when we test your blood, your immune system will be functioning a lot better just with my 30-second empathic comment. So they, um, if that's happening with medical students, you know something's happening with, with young children when they're yeah. in an environment where they're seen. Yeah. What else does it soothed. look like? Soothed? Well, soothed. It's where if you're in distress, this is where compassion comes in, you know your teacher or your parent or your friend, they will, number one, sense your suffering, your distress. Number two, imagine in their minds how they might reduce your suffering. And number three, try something to try to help you feel better. So that's the As soothing part. As opposed to what? As opposed to just, even if the person's empathic but without compassion, they would just say, oh, whatever, you know. Or they could say, get over it, it's not that, it's not that bad. Yeah, just, just, yeah, pull yourself up bad. by your bootstraps. <laughs> by your bootstraps. By your high heel bootstraps. We clearly have a theme <laughs> here. You set the stage. <laughs> We're sitting on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that's so the that's soothing. The and then, and then soothing. safe, and safe involves both being protected from harm, um, you know, and also not the, the, the parent or the teacher or whatever, not being the source of terror. Yeah. So in my field, I'm an attachment researcher, you know, we study the very painful situation when an attachment figure, which could be a parent, a grandparent, or a teacher, is the source of terror. It, it's a, a very unique situation um, mm. where part of the brain says, when I'm in a state of terror, I should go toward my protector. But if your protector is the source of terror, another part of your brain says, well, I got to get away from this source of terror and go toward the source of terror. Mm -hmm. So you have one body, and there's one source of both protection and terror, so you fragment. Mm -hmm. So that's very, diff that's very different than almost any other kind of thing, and so it leads to something called dissociation. Yeah. Or in, in attachment terms, it's called disorganized attachment. So some people would say the, the world isn't going to say yes to you always. So are you setting a, a child up to think that, that everywhere they go, that they come to expect, that it's going to be smooth, it's going to be yeah. accepting? And I did a documentary a few years ago called Hyper Parents and Coddled Kids, and it's yeah. still being used because there's some concern that parents are overprotecting. They're yes. over-yesing. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. So this is where um, 
Tina Bryce and I, my co-author, um, were, were nervous about naming a book The Yes Brain because we thought people would interpret it as exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And so we say in the first paragraph of the book, we are not saying this is about saying yes. It's more about Rick's idea of an unshakable core. You know, it's like Linda's idea of you know, grounding, that children should be given the opportunity to develop this deep yes brain state so that, of course, you're always going to be creating structure for them and limits. And if, as a teacher or a caregiver, you've been providing this where attention goes, neural firing goes, neural connection grows, you've been providing this core source, I call, think of it's an integrative state of the brain, is what research would suggest. When you've created this integrative source, you know, it's, I, I think you heard this from Kimberly yesterday, you know, it's this, the new study of well-being shows you can actually build this inner, from a brain point of view, I think it's an integrated brain, so that when life presents you with the inevitable, you know, pushing up against things that don't go the way you want to go, you have resilience. It's a definition of resilience, is to have this inner yes brain capacity so that even when things get tough, it's the growth mindset, it's where you get grit, it's where you have your um, capacity to know who you are, but also join with other people. And that capacity to belong without losing a sense of your individuality is what is so missing, at least in the United States. There's, a, there's just this huge lack of everything we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I don't know how it is here in Canada, but in the US, we, we have a serious, serious problem where social media is presenting this very surfacey illusion of connection, an illusion of meaning, and that's kind of the surface frustration with it. But on the, and that's, now here comes the negative side. There's so much um, artificial happiness being presented in the social media platform that if you're a kid who's just trying to know the truth about life and you see all these images of happy, 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 always happy, happy, you're going to feel defective. Because or an no, adult. It's not just for children. I mean, adults or too adult, feel right. defective. Or adults, right. I forgot yeah. about adults, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or even adults. Even adults, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, one of the questions that just came is related to that. How do I best teach or, I guess, um, I'm not sure the word teach is right, a yes brain if I am mostly in a no brain state and I'm not even aware of it? So wow. That's a good one, right? That's really, that's, that's, that's the whole book in a nutshell. So, um, so just the, say read the book and we'll No, move no, on. no, I, I can address it. <laughs> I can address it. So the first answer is, you know, the no brain state is a profound state that many of us are in, in the world we're in. You know, the, the, the acronym that's used in the media and the military that we just should name is VUCA, V-U-C-A. It's volatile. It's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. So let's just name it so we can try to tame it. You know, we live in really, really, really hard times. So it's very understandable if, like this person is saying, I'm in a no-brain state a lot. No kidding. I mean, this is a really hard world we're in, you know? And you don't know, should you watch the news or should you not watch the mm -hmm. news? You know, I mean, it's, we, we had a big discussion of this at our dinner last night. You know, so, so I want to honor that you're not alone. And the next step is that since you live in a body that comes from a long evolutionary history, with the VUCA world as it is, it's our responsibility as adults to start with ourselves. Because if we're in a no-brain reactive state, understandably, this isn't to get mad at yourself or say, oh, there's something wrong with me. No, it's just, this is the physiology of it. We need to cultivate the grounding, the unshakable core. We need, to, we need to build these inner yes brain states, is a way of saying it. These are all parallel things, and these are the same, we're all on the same journey here. You know? And the idea is that it's our responsibility as adults to put our oxygen mask on first, you know, and build that yes brain capacity I, I myself do something called the wheel of awareness, which is a very simple practice, which distinguishes awareness in the hub of a wheel from anything you're aware of, like your worries about the world on the rim. So when you distinguish the hub of awareness from the rim of what you're aware of, the what you're aware of can be called the knowns, 
and the knowing is in the hub, you know, you'd be amazed how you get this unshakable, grounded, deep source of resilience and well-being from the hub. It's actually true, and it's online, Wheel of Awareness. And it was the first that I, thing that I tried that was at least a bit related to kind of mindfulness. And it was a, a great entry point. And you're right. If I, if I lay down and I listen to you talking to, to my ear through the machine, <laughs> and uh, I go through the wheel of awareness, creativity comes back. I, it, um, something about that brings me out of that moment as if it as if it's the only moment in the world and, and exactly. lets me pull back and, and make decisions, better decisions. So that's a good, that's a really good tool to yeah, share. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The, yeah. the, the next book I wrote is called Aware, The yes. Science and Practice of Presence. Yes. And, and, and the idea of presence, which is a word we can use for what all these things are really meaning, yeah. it's what the yes brain state is. It's where exactly like you're saying, Maria, where you can, in this simple thing, I mean, I'll give you a little example of, of, of grounding and all that kind of stuff. There was a kid who I called Billy, and a, a kindergarten teacher wrote me this in a set of emails. So Billy was in one school, and he beat up another kid, a kindergarten, a five-year-old, beat up another kid on the yard, was expelled from that school, and was placed in the new school, and Mrs. Smith was his kindergarten teacher. She learned to do the Wheel of Awareness with her students um, through Whole Brain Child, whatever, and she learned how to do it. So she taught all the students that, including Billy. So the next day, after her, his first day of arriving there after learning the, the wheel, just as a drawing, not a meditation or anything, Billy comes to Mrs. Smith and says, Mrs. Smith, you need to give me a break because I'm on the yard and I'm about to punch Joey because he took my block. Hmm. I'm lost on my rim. I got to get back to my hub. Hmm. <laughs> Amazing. And, and then she wrote back. I said, tell me how it goes. And he became a pro-socially integrated kid in that school and never had a problem again. So the idea that, you know, even a five-year-old can take the idea of distinguishing awareness from the thing you're aware of and be present to go from a no-brain reactivity that can be on the rim, that's not what the rim is all about, but part of reactivity is on the rim, to a yes-brain state which comes from this place of presence. Yeah. And the amazing thing, and this is a, now you won't have to read the book Aware, the, the thing that is absolutely amazing to me when you look at the deep science that exists now on consciousness and on love is the neural correlates of pure consciousness, this presence of the hub, and the neural correlates of pure love, your deep compassion, are indistinguishable. When you drop into pure consciousness, you get filled with lo love and joy. And so this is the... This is the absolutely, and I talk about kind of the science of why that would be, but, but in terms of this unshakable core and the, and the grounding and the resilience and all the things we're talking about, we free up love when we build a yes brain state. And, and then you realize we're all in this together. And you look at the studies of not just that person with the common cold, and that's where you receive the love because your physician was present with you. Or you look at collective intelligence, right? The studies where you teach kids to collaborate with each other or adults to collaborate with each other, where everyone has something to, in a differentiated way to then link together. So that's what integration is, the linking of differentiated parts. Collective intelligence beats out individual effort every time. And we need to have kids in school learn how to do this. Yes, I mean, right. there's a school I advise in New York called the Blue School. And we've gone from preschool all the way up now. They have an eighth grade class graduating. So they called me up, because I've been their advisor from the beginning, uh, before the school started. And, and they said, will you give an, the commencement address for the eighth graders? And I thought, sure. I, don't, you know, I thought that's what an honor to talk you to a 14 year old you know, about this. But yeah. this is exactly it, yeah. where you can feel when you meet these kids, they've been given the opportunity. It's a special you know, yeah. thing we've been doing for all these years. But you can cultivate yeah. these generative social fields. And imagine a child who's had that, who then has the inner core of resilience, so that when they go out in the world and they face the problems that the world has, they don't get thrown to become incapacitated into chaos or rigidity. Mm -hmm. They stay. Yes, they can get sad and have a bad day, for sure. But they have the resilience that the new generation mm -hmm. is going to need 
to face the future that we adults are giving them. Well, the video that we saw yesterday, the resilience video, I'd say that the children resilience through their eyes, that was an example of that because they, they had had support in the schools and in their classrooms, just, just every child, it wasn't just special children, to be able to name their emotions, recognize their emotions, know what it took to get help. So those basic skills they just have now and so they they recognize help when it's there and they take it and they help others well it was a beautiful video and i was going to ask you about that because in a way this comes to this person's question you know how do you build the kind of resilience they show or you know how do you actually think about building a yes brain approach and and basically it's really simple it's saying how do we as educators or we as caregivers or even just with each other help each other cultivate skills. Yes. So discipline isn't about punishment, it's about teaching, and teaching in particular skills, which often in schools doesn't get taught. So you say, what are the skills? And it spells, and I have an acronym addiction, and it spells it, this is a cheesy acronym, it spells the word BRIE, B-R-I-E. You can teach the skills of balance, resilience, insight, and empathy. You know, and mm -hmm. empathy with the largest sense of empathy, meaning feeling the inner life of another person mm -hmm. and empathic concern, mm -hmm. which is a gateway for compassion. Um, yeah, so you can, you know, and if you wanted to, we can talk about how do you actually build balance to allow a person to know when they're in no brain or yes brain state and get back to yeah. uh, that, that, that flow of integration, really. Yeah. How, how do you teach them resilience, which is to give them the, the, the capacity to hold, just like you're saying about those kids, hold what they're feeling yeah and realize, oh, it's just a, a rim point. Mm -hmm. I've got an inner hub mm -hmm. that gives me this clarity of mind, you know? Yeah. And then the uh, insight is that knowing your inner life and empathy is to say, uh, the life that you have, Maria, is different from the life that's inside of this body, mm -hmm. but it's really important that I tune into what's going on in you, recognize we're different, and then link together with compassionate right. connection. I, and the good news is that the book that all of you have, it's a really, it's a wonderful exercise book, really, because yeah. you give examples of exactly how to do that. I'd love to do a bit of that to describe more. But and one of the questions here, though, is, as a, as a precursor to that, that little exercise that happened between us where you, um, you, t you, you spoke in a way about my saying, what did I say? Oh, bless you. Oh, bless you, yeah. And this person is saying, there's an example, it took a lot of effort on your part to have to twist your words around so that you weren't saying no to me. And this person's saying, how the heck would I have patience to do that all day long? <laughs> I just want to say, no. Yeah, that's right. Well, first of all, um, any kind of skill, you know, like riding a bicycle or whatever, any kind of skill when you first do it takes intentional, conscious, energy-consuming effort, for sure. So this questioner, I'm right with him or her. I, I, absolutely. Does it take some energy and effort? Of course. Anything does. But once you actually learn the skill of riding a bike, you get on the bike and you ride it. So while the energy you know, to make it happen at first is some energy, yeah. Um, the rewards are profound. Yeah. And so there is a way of you know, learning to do this. I was giving a lecture the other day um, uh, in San Francisco, and you know, someone asked a question. I did give them a kind of a no-brain response, although a lot of people afterwards at the lunch said, no, that wasn't a no-brain response, so I was too hard on myself. That's a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> but in any event, I felt like I did. So before the lunch break, before the lunch break, there was question and answer period, and then there was a pause, and, 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 I, and I turned to the fellow who I, had, I felt I had not been so yes, yes to. Yes to. Um, and I said, I want to come back to your question because I think I mishandled that. And I think I mishandled it because of this reason, this reason, this reason. And he got, you could see he was kind of emotionally, he goes, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, and I said, I'd like to you know, play it out a little further. Tell me more about what you meant about what you said. He then said, well, thank you, and he said a whole, a whole bunch of really interesting things. We had this really interesting dialogue with each other, and it, it brings up what you're saying, Maria, is um, a repair ah, I love that. is the most underrepresented word about our relationships. And, and what I did was I said to him, I'm sorry. I feel I did something that really wasn't right, and I want to come back to you, and let's make a repair about it. And so... I'm not saying you should make ruptures on purpose so you can demonstrate repair, <laughs> but they happen plenty of times. 
And when they happen, we got to be ready to say, you know, I'm sorry. I wasn't yeah, yeah. my no, totally, ideal self totally. there. Let's, let's take that two. That word, repair, since I first heard you talk about that, it's so much a part of me now. When I do something uh, towards someone else, then even sometimes later I realize that I had done it. I, that word just automatically comes, just like a voice in my head, repair. Yeah. So it's saying, um, don't continue to beat yourself up. Uh, don't phone in the middle of the night and say, I'm sorry I did that, whatever it is. Just know that you can repair this. Yeah. And that means to go back and do it. So I think that word itself should be, you know, bold yeah. in, your, in your mind. I love yeah. that idea. And, that, and so this person, the next question is, uh, would you say that a no brain uh, is reversible then? Can you, can you repair in a big way if you find yourself now sitting in this room and you realize you have a no brain or a child in your life who has a no brain, who just says, no, no, I'm not going to that swing party. No, I'm not going to do what you, it, yeah. can you reverse it? Yes. Good. Next question. <laughs> no, so, but to elaborate that, um, so, you know, it, it, the, the thing that's so fun about this whole yes brain strategy is, it, is that if you identify that the no brain reactive state has the four components of fight, flight, freeze, and faint, and, and inevitably someone quotes one of my UCLA professors say, well, women actually have tend to befriend. And that's, that may be true, it's actually in both males and females. But that's a much higher brain state that's not about um, your threat of life. It's when there's a lot of stress and you go to tend and befriend. So that's a whole other thing. But when you get to the, everyone has this fight, flight, freeze, and faint way of reacting when you're threatened with survival. So the issue here um, is that you can identify, well, do I tend to fight back? Do I tend to flee? Do I freeze up and, 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 and paralyze myself? Or am I feeling so overwhelmed that I collapse? And in any of those, if you're trying to engage with other people from a no brain reactive fight, flight, freeze, or faint state, it's not gonna go so well in whatever kind of relationship mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. talking about, mm -hmm. professional, personal, educational, anything, it's just not gonna go well. So we need to know ourselves like that, be kind to ourselves as best we can, understand that the brain, um, you know, has a tendency to watch for things that are gonna harm us. That's, that's just an evolutionary principle, that things that will allow you to not be killed are things that will take priority, right? So you wanna realize you're just human, you're in a body. You know, you got into a body, it's been around for a long, long time, it's got all sorts of body things it does, and so one of them is this no brain thing. And then you wanna use your mind to get your brain to do something it doesn't naturally want to do. How do you do that? You do that with all sorts of practices. I mean, even just the grounding practice, let's say we did with Linda this morning. You talk to yourself? Of, and you talk to yourself, you can do that. Although I was just reading a paper yesterday that how you talk to yourself matters. You don't want to say, that was really stupid, Dan. <laughs> Not that kind of talk. No, 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 no. no. But, you know, that was you human for you to, to do then, right? The yes, brain, yeah, right? so kindly yeah. talk to yes, yourself. Yes, yes, yes. You know, this is why the three pillars of what you do are yeah. you develop focused attention, open awareness, and kind intention. Yeah, yeah. Those are three pillars. Yeah. And when you develop those three pillars, and this is kind of what the wheel does, but there are lots of practices yeah. that do that, you know, then what you do is you say, I can use my mind mm -hmm. to go from the no brain state I was just in talking to that person in a seminar or with my child or with a student. And I can now move myself even doing this, putting a hand on your chest, that, that actually pulls yourself from reactivity to receptivity. So from no brain to yes brain. You can focus on your breath, that actually does the same thing. You, talking to yourself in yeah, a yeah. kind way, that's a good thing. And, oh, yeah. So uh, when, in this book, Aware, you know, I was trying to summarize like, what is, if you look at all of the science of meditation or reflective practices, what does it come down to? And you can find these three scientific things that have been identified. And Richie Davidson and Dan Goldman have this in a beautiful uh, book called Altered Traits. And Elizabeth Blackburn and Alyssa Eppel put aspects of this in the telomere effect. Um, these are just resources if you want to read this science review. In Aware, it's just a practice book, like, like how do you practice those things? So the three of them are focused attention, open awareness, and I call it kind intention because intention, awareness, and attention are three fundamental mental processes. 
So underneath kind intention would be things like compassion and love and caring, but also empathic joy, which unfortunately is missing when you just talk about compassion training, yeah, or you know, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. compassion is about suffering. You want to have people also having empathic joy where you say, I love when someone else is happy. When someone else succeeds, it's succeeding. It's basically trying to grow in this world a view of ourselves as the light that's given off by candles, not just the wax. And that's what I would call kind intention when you realize, you know, when, when another candle, if we're all candles in this room, but we realize the mind and the self and our identity is actually the light we give off as much as the wax that we live in. So if these bodies are the wax, we need to raise the next generation to realize we've made a mistake in modern culture. Contemporary culture has put the self in the body, just like for 2,500 years since the time of Hippocrates, we put the mind in the head, which for me anyway is not only a scientific error, it's a cultural lie that is killing us. Because if the mind is only from the head and the self is only from the body, then who cares about anything else but what happens to this body? Your body only gets about 100 years to live on this planet. So if you realize you're the light, the mind is our inter as well as our inner, then it's going to shift how humanity treats itself no matter what the color of your skin or religious background you have, and how we treat other species. Because we, we have this species arrogant, body arrogant view that the self is just the solo player on the planet. You know? And so that, that's not just a, a way of living a meaningless and disconnected life. It's a way of destroying Earth and all those beautiful things that Maria showed us in that exquisite film. Mm -hmm. you know? And so part of what I feel so excited about, about being here, you know, at this educational conference about heart and mind, the Dalai Lama Center is, and the reason I said I really want to come here, even though I was actually at another conference, so I gave the opening address there and I hopped on the plane the next day to be here with all of you and all of us together, is because as educators, you are the hope for the future. Because the way- And parents. And, and parents. And the way parents and educators will raise the sense of self of the next generation will determine whether we make it or not as a member of life on Earth here. I'm serious about that. And that's something, you know, the yes brain approach that you can use for your individual child, and I know we're talking about big conceptual ideas, but it starts one relationship at a time. And yeah. if a child starts to feel the awe that you invited us to feel, Maria, yeah. they're going to feel like, you know, my job as a kid is to realize I am the light beyond the wax alone. Yeah, yeah I'm just thinking that um, we're, you, some people are going to be coming with you to the Big Conversation small group next. And what you have done here this morning, as you do so beautifully, is make us understand not only what's happening between us, but what's happening in our mind and our body, how big it is and what the potential there is, yeah. as you just brought to now, to, to make the world a better place. That, that for people sometimes, after hearing that, may be wondering, but how do I begin? This is the good news and such a wonderful gift that you gave us with the, with the book, that every single person has that book. So if you're feeling at all like, I just need the how-to, I just need the lesson plan, trust me. This book takes you through very, very simply how one piece of it, you start by that, that one relationship with that one child. Yeah. And uh, that's a wonderful gift. And can I, can I add one thing to that? Yeah. You know, and this, this is what Tina and I really wanted. The, 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 um, our deepest hope for the book yeah. was it would be helpful, you know, to parents, to educators. And within that, we really wanted to invite the reader to consider how we as a, a modern culture could redefine what success means. Yeah. Because, seriously, we, we, we've... You know, we, we've, we've created this incredible product orientation to success. And I think we've come to learn um, in, in how we've done this chapter of modern culture that it is not sustainable and it is destructive. And to put it quite simply, when you put the self in the body 
and you have life oriented in terms of success around accumulating products, rather than having a process focus. So in linguistics terms, it's like we're so focused on the noun-like concreteness of who am I, who's Dan, who's Maria, who are all you, you know, this noun-like view. And it's harder, but it's, and that's a linear perspective. We need to take on a verb-like view of what the self is, a process. It's an emerging unfolding. When we at least take that step, you can then redefine success as the deep nature of our relationships with each other. So that grounding and an unshakable core and well-being and, and the awe, all of that is relational. Now, once you go to the level of defining success as relational, then what is so interesting about that is ah, you take a deep breath, and at least in my experience running workshops is people go, I feel like this deep sense of relief. And ironically, this comes back to the no yes experiment, the product noun-like view of modern culture constantly creates a no-brain state, this underlying mm -hmm. state of threat, mm -hmm. fear of missing out, I'm not happy enough, I'm not... You don't have enough. I don't have enough. I don't know. Yeah, but when right. you drop into presence and process, it's just about loving each other hmm. and showing up for each other. And each other is not just human beings, other species, and it's not just human beings and other species now. It's our ancestors from before, and it's those who will follow. So that 200 years from now, in this very room, if we all do this right, people here will be shining the light that came from all of the candles that are allowing that glow to be shared right now because we live across time. And all of that is about kindness and compassion and love. And that's where resilience comes from, and that's what well-being comes from. And so instead of, you know, I was teaching at a parliament recently in another country, and we did the wheel, and a guy got into the, the, the hub like we do in the practice, and then in the break, he wouldn't say anything during the discussion. He comes up to me in the break, he goes, um, can I talk to you? I go, sure. And he goes, do you notice I didn't say anything during the question and discussion period? I said, yeah, I noticed that. He goes, do you want to know why? I said. Sure, why? <laughs> he says, when I did the wheel of awareness practice, I go, yeah. And he goes, and we bend the spoke around, spoke of attention around into the hub. I go, yeah. And he gets really teary. When I got in that pure state of awareness, I go, yeah. He goes, I have never felt so much love before in my life. So I said, okay. I said, so, you, and he said, so if I would have spoken up about that, my fellow parliament members would think I was really weak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, so let me get this. You felt so much love in the hub. He goes, absolutely. I said, that you didn't want to share it with your colleagues because they would think you were weak. He goes, yes. And you didn't want to look weak. I, he goes, yes. I said, so that's why you didn't want to share it. He goes, yes, exactly. So then there was this silence. We're like staring at each other. So I said, so let me ask you one more question. He goes, okay. I said, so when you're making public policy, when you're making law for mm -hmm. your country, do you leave love out? And his eyes get really big, and he starts wagging his finger at me. And he goes, oh. And then he takes off, and he goes chatting up his parliament members. Oh, wow. But that's, that's what we have to do. We have to make sure kindness, compassion, and love are seen as the strongest ways of being in human life, instead of how they're considered weak and you're just, you know, yeah. this and that. It takes the, courage. It takes courage, and that's the courage all of us together can create. Yeah. And I always joke, and I did this with that group, and I'll say it to you here. You know, if you really want to move society into a yes brain state, we got to get away from the separate me way of doing it and realize you don't just give up the body wax that you have to take care of and sleep well and feed well and exercise and enjoy and all that stuff. But we're also a we, and if you integrate me and we, you get a mwe, M-W-E, and mwe, mwe. <laughs> Mwas can do this. You know, mwe is the kind of identity the next generation needs to have. When you say, who are you? A child can say, I am a mwe. And then, seriously, I'm actually- We'll see. I'm really serious about this. Because if they start having that identity, 
then when they reach out to what in other generations we would have called the other, it's called othering, they'd realize this candle is a part of moi's. It's <laughs> really, it is, it is just an extension of who you are. Think about a world where all we did was light up each other's wicks and what kind of bright world we could have. That is all a doable right. thing.